Um, my name is Karen Steelman, and I'm currently serving on Aurora's Board of Directors as Secretary. Um, I've been on the board since 2015. Uh, I find it a very rewarding volunteer experience. Um, uh, I'd like to read our mission statement uh, for everyone just to start out here. The American Rock Art Research Association is a diverse community of members with wide ranging interests who are dedicated to rock art preservation, research and education in order to communicate to a broad audience the significance of rock art as a non-renewable resource of enduring cultural value and an important expression of our shared cultural heritage. Um, we are a member-based organization, so if you would like to join or are looking for more information, uh, please check out our website. Um, I put a link to our website. Uh, it's the first thing in the chat to everyone. Um, it actually goes directly to our conference registration, but it'll get you to the website. And so you can go explore. Um, earlier, uh, when we were doing our uh, social time, we were talking about um, that our organization had a booth at the Society for American Archaeology Conference in Chicago about a week and a half ago. And we interacted with students who are interested in learning more about rock art. And I wanted to thank Linda Olson um, for really spearheading that um, and all the other people who volunteered. We do have an upcoming virtual conference and that's going to be, mark your calendars, it's June 18th and 19th. It's June 18th and 19th and there'll be talks and also video field trips. And you can register for that on our website. Uh, we were also talking about earlier um, uh, workshops uh, that are going to be happening um, the day before. So on June 17th, uh, we were talking about uh, the workshop that Linnea Sundstrom has organized on rock art site management. Um, we will be uh, shortly promoting a second workshop um, that is uh, on rock art education activities for grades three through five. Um, we're going to gear that mainly towards um, teachers, but if you are interested in volunteering in your schools, um, I think this is going to be great. I know I'm going to sign up for it. Um, so again, please check out our website at aurora.wildpapercot.org. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, my very good friend, Margaret Barrier. Um, Margaret received her BA in art education at Indiana University. And she began recording petroglyphs, uh, petroglyphs in 1986, I had to ask her, so 1986 in Utah. But since then, she continued to research, record, and photograph other rock art sites throughout North America and even in other countries. She is an experienced rock art researcher who's made contributions to the study of rock art, especially in Texas and in New Mexico. But she's also helped to document sites in Australia and in Sweden. In 2009, she began recording rock art as part of the Archaeological Society of New Mexico's Doña Ana Archaeological Society. And she also works as a volunteer for the Bureau of Land Management at the Las Cruces office recording sites in the region. For her work as an archivist for the El Paso Archaeological Society from 2006 to 2010, she was awarded their distinctive award. She was awarded the 2017 Castleton Award for Excellence in Original Essay from uh, Ferrara from the American Rock Art Research Association, and also the 2018 Archaeological Society of New Mexico's Price Award for Archaeological Achievement for, by an Avocationalist. Um, Margaret was recently elected to Ferrara's Board of Directors, so I'm happy to have her as a, a a, a person in arms to, to work on um, issues with organization. And I was recently um, got to spend time with her in Chicago where she presented her research at the Society for American Archaeology Conference. Tonight, her talk is entitled Comparisons Between Members Ceramics and Hornada Mogollon Petroglyphs and Picture Crafts. And thank you, Mark Leff, for volunteering to talk to us tonight. And I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, let me start the screen share here. So, um, 
I, as, as Karen pointed out, I've been re recording and, and visiting rock art for a long time. I moved to Las Cruces in uh, 2006, and so I've been able to really concentrate on this area, which uh, I find really fascinating. Um, during the pandemic, I was asked to join a group of memories researchers, and they inspired me to look in some different directions. So this is a view of um, the landscape from Three Rivers. One thing I, I'm going to kind of dive down, um, but I think the landscape is an important piece. I heard a great talk this um, in the SAA about the landscape. I don't want to lessen that, but at this point, there's only so much you can cover. These little pieces of, of ceramics are from a site at uh, next to Three Rivers, and those are all membrane shards. Um, this is quite a ways, 175 kilometers, I think, um, from the Membrays Valley to Three Rivers. Uh, I decided I should start this uh, presentation with uh, a little bit more of an introduction than I usually do because I know not everyone is familiar with the rock art of my favorite area. And so a lot of you have probably heard of Chaco and the amazing sites there. It's a beautiful place. Um, but uh, there's a whole lot more to the Southwest than just Chaco. There's also these beautiful memories, um, ceramics, which a lot of people have seen that don't really know much about the memories people. But the iconography is just stunning. That's been... Um, Partially a good thing and partially a bad thing. Uh, because they're so beautiful, they've been um, looted. And um, so it's sometimes hard to study them. The thing that struck me after being in this area for a while is the similarities between many of the images. So uh, for those of you that don't know where I'm talking about, um, let's see if I can make my highlighter work. Um, so here I am in Las Cruces right now. This is the area that is normally considered the Membres. This is the area that's normally considered the Horta Montana Mogollon, which is the rock art I'll be talking about. Um, um, this map is courtesy of Art Al Dart, and you see um, the the blobs kind of are the way the archaeologists explain um, and categories categorize the rock art. Um, I don't always agree with all of these. Um, I think there's a nuance, but that will at least get you, if you're not familiar with the area, to know where I'm talking about. Now, Polly Shaftsma has a little different idea about where the Mo or not a Mogollon rock art is. Um, I kind of more agree with her actually having, um, since she studies rock art and I study rock art, the area is, um, goes further west but it doesn't go as far um, to the east. Uh, one of the things that archeologists use different things to determine where they think the boundaries are. And one of the things I'd like to show this evening is some of the data that I've been studying will support this view um, that, um, that Polly has, Polly and um, Aaron Wright. So first of all, now we'll talk about the dating. So. Um, I always feel a little silly when I'm talking to myself, um, especially because I'm uh, here alone. I guess I'll just talk to the cats. Um, uh, Zoom is a wonderful thing to, uh, to be able to experience, but it's, uh, it's also a challenge for the presenter. And I really appreciate everybody who's done that this year. Um, so these are the dates for the memories area. Most of the comparisons I'm going to show are in this period um, 900 to 1140. And uh, the, the memories uh, ceramics have been dated very carefully. Um, and so I'm going to do some comparison. I also, um, the rock art of uh, the Hornada is less well known in some other areas, but it is often elaborate. And uh, um, so I'm going to show some of these comparisons. So first of all, um, the field work that is I've done um, has helped me to do these comparisons, but I couldn't have done it without 
many people who've helped me over the years, including um, various friends who took me out to sites and uh, the archives that I've worked with. This is at Three Rivers. But also what is I find is really important. One of the things that happens is that people go out to rock art sites and they take pictures, they don't document the sites, and then they make comparisons without really knowing everything that's there. So one of the things that I have concentrated on is getting all of these different kinds of information on the sites in my area so that you can really do comparisons instead of make, making generalizations. There are other people, obviously, that have come before me that feel, feel like there are comparisons between the Membrys rock art and um, the Hornada, uh, between the Membrys ceramics and the Hornada um, imagery. Uh, these are several of the examples. Uh, but most of those people um, just looked at Three Rivers and they, many of them, um, she includes one of them is Helen Crotty. She shared with me her PowerPoint that she did several years ago, which was very helpful. Um, and I've taken it a step further to be able to look at uh, rock art across the area. Um, and another thing that is important to note now is that one of the things when those comparisons were done earlier, um, the date range for Hornada rock art was 1000 um, AD to 1450. Now Miles Miller has um, actually done dating of some um, elements of to bleed to headdresses and other things to be able to change this date range to much earlier, AD 600. So this pushes the back, um, the, the rock art dating for this area. And it's really important because if you remember from this, uh, the days on Membres, um, they started later. So part of the question is who, who um, influenced who? I was really lucky to be able to get access to what is called the Memories Database. Uh, used to be that you looked, at, you had to look in books and at museums, but there is an online database of over 10,000 um, Memories ceramics. It's wonderful to be able to look at that. You have to have a research design and a reason to use it. There is a general category, so you get to see the public um, um, images, but not all of them. There are some, um, so that's predominantly the, the, the source I use to, to do my comparison. I also have books and did uh, museum visits. We have a great museum in Silver City, uh, the Western New Mexico um, University Museum that has a Nan Ranch collection and they make it available and you can photograph it, uh, which is wonderful. There are some um, challenges with working with the membranes. Um, and so I've tried to mitigate some of these. First of all, um, you are not allowed to um, publish things that aren't in the public domain. And you need to be careful because um, these many of these items were part of um, are associated with burials. So in a respectful way, rather than using photographs or trying to find, uh, to get permission for, to use the photographs, I've drawn all of these images. I think that I had a special gift by doing this because one of the things that happens is when I, I was tracing photographs, um, it puts, that imagery in a different part of your brain. And so uh, it was, I also do the same for rock art. So those connections are made easier by drawing. It, it just is something that happens in your brain and it's been documented. Um, anyhow, there's also, when you're comparing rock art to ceramics, there's definitely some difference. It's, first of all, rock art doesn't go anywhere. Um, most of the time. Um, I have seen a few pieces, uh, a few boulders in um, museums, but generally it is where um, it started out to be. But 
the um, memory ceramics have gone to museums, they've gone to collections, and they were traded. Obviously, those pieces of um, memories pottery that I showed in the first slide had to come from somewhere. They actually can do testing and determine that the memories weren't making pottery in the Three Rivers area, but this is definitely Three Rivers style. There's also the difference, if you think about it, most of those ceramics are round. And when you're an artist, you paint um, for the canvas and it can move around in a circle. You can make it more interesting by um, dividing it in half and, and making mirror images, as opposed to um, in rock art, you just deal with the space that you have. The rock art um, is also on a surface that is bumpy. It's much more difficult if you've ever tried. I have a little boulder I pecked on once. It's not really as easy as you would think it is, um, but painting with a brush and some, some good pigment is a little bit easier. So you definitely have, there's some of the differences that we see between the comparisons is due to the media and not necessarily um, a difference in cosmology. So the things that I kind of looked at, um, um, my research design involved geometrics versus representation. Well, um, the memories, um, imagery is in a database and they've determined that about um, two thirds of it is geometric. Those are harder to compare because they're complex. But there are some comparisons that I call thematic. There are some that are visual and then some that use artistic conventions or styles. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. I'm gonna show you a lot of examples because I don't think, I truly believe that when you see pictures of the side-by-side -side imagery, <coughs> it's pretty easy to see how they compare. So one of the artistic conventions that is used um, is the use of negative space. Now I know that some people don't like the term rock art um, or um, the use of art it, to describe this. In this case, I'm using it to talk about um, how the paint was applied to the space. So there are some of those conventions here. Um, these, these two are pretty amazingly similar. This is um, a picture from Waco Tanks and a um, drawing of the pot from um, the Deming Museum. <coughs> Excuse me. There are lots of geometrics in the rock art as well as the pottery. They are a little bit harder to compare. Um, I have done a few. I want to do some more uh, because I think that's important. And here's a few of those examples. What I call thematic comparisons are um, things that seem like they're talking about the same thing, the same theme. And um, this interesting figure holding the fish that has this um, <coughs> flaming um, triangle, uh, it, it appears in this pot, it's just an amazing comparison between the two. There are also, um, one of the interesting things I did early on in the pandemic is I heard a discussion. Um, uh, I, the, it was actually the first Zoom I attended by Patricia Gilman, and she gave a talk um, where she was interpreting um, in some of the uh, memories images and talked a lot about the fish on the memories pottery. And I asked her if, uh, anybody had looked at the rock art in the similar fashion and she said no, but Margot, that's a great idea, but why don't you start that project? So I did, and it was really fun to, to do comparisons. The interesting thing is that fish in rock art in this in the Southwest is not a very common theme I've asked. Um, and it was surprising to see that there were over a hundred. Um, I know there are probably more in this area. So these are some examples of similarities between the fish. 
some of those images may have been ceremony. And I use that word very loosely. This is not, um, <clears throat> when I say ceremony, it's, it's used in a fashion that is not what you would normally see. So um, these um, things on a stick um, are, are pretty common in the members in the Ornata rock art. And they include other things as fish, whether they are on a standard or something else. Um, I'm not sure. We also have some very, what I consider uh, long lasting imagery that goes all across the time periods for the membranes, where some of the other ones were later, um, these uh, interlocking scrolls appear everywhere. <coughs> and they also appear in the rock art everywhere. Almost every rock art site that I've been to um, with it, the exception of a few have somewhere on them have these little spirals. And this, this one here is actually from Southeast Arizona and it's that, that far end that um, Polly um, has drawn into the, um, the boundary that wasn't drawn by um, previous uh, researchers. Another geometric um, combination, this um, spiral and triangle, it appears also at a lot of rock art sites. Um, this was, I, I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite finds because um, these don't seem like really obvious comparisons. I mean, you look at, there's a step, fret, step fret design, which is fairly common in um, both uh, the, the rock imagery and in the ceramics. But this triangle is kind of interesting. So um, I was really delighted to find those same images on some pots. And um, most, most recently, I was continuing my research and found this one on the body of um, a zoomorph. So they're definitely, this doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. Uh, they seem like an obvious cosmologic connection. One of my favorite projects that started long ago was documenting um, these large-eyed figures. Um, I was inspired by my friend John Davis, who had a collection that he had pictures of. And um, when he died, his kids gave me all of his material. So I continued doing that. When he um, stopped uh, when he, he had 187 images, and since then I have, um, have found many more. It's mostly 600, it's almost 600. Um, and I've had the, I have had the help of many, many people. Um, what's interesting too is that two effigy figures that were made of Sotol um, were found with this same design with these big eyes the trapezoidal head, um, and <clears throat> they have been dated from 600 AD to 1200 AD. This is a very long time period. Um, compare when you compare things in other areas. This was this culture, the Hornata culture, lasted a long time, and it is perhaps because of the imagery they had some cohesion because they shared cosmology. Also, um, I didn't mention that um, there's definitely, you know, I mean, this border um, I wished was more permeable because there are obviously images of goggle eyes and other rock art in Mexico. I'm hoping to find some colleagues who will help. I did have um, uh, one experience where um, this image here is shared uh, by, um, uh, somebody from Facebook and gave me permission to use the goggle eye that um, he found in Mexico, which is right here. So as you see, that area goes further, but it doesn't go as far as the rock art is not the same in the, um, in the Guadalupe Mountains. And many of the boundaries drawn for the Hornada go over into um, the Guadalupe's, but the rock art is different. 
the um, pottery may be the same, but the rock art is not. There are, are um, examples of uh, these goggle eyes on memories pottery and um, numerous examples of them. Some of them are simply uh, two dotted circles, but many of them are very fantastic with elaborate designs painted or packs on the, the bodies. Another image that we see, it's uh, a very interesting one, are our figures with um, to what are called tablita headdresses. Now, um, if you remember the dating uh, slide I showed where they um, dated the tablita headdresses, this is what a tablita headdress might have looked like. We can't be sure that they actually wore these headdresses, um, but they did depict them on top of people's heads. So that to me, indicates that it was certainly a possibility or they may have had a cloud over their head. What's interesting is there's just not many um, tablita headdresses in the, the um, ceramic, the members some ceramics. Although if you remember, these parts of the, that, um, the things that Miles Miller dated were all part of tablita headdresses. So, and this was found in, in um, part of these were found um, in West Texas and part of them were found in the Membris Valley. We also find similarities in other media. So it's not just um, the ceramics and the rock art. Here's a comparison um, that, um, this is one of my favorite images of these, the two birds um, that are supporting or um, uh, flanking a cloud terrace. And during our members discussion, Harry Schaefer said, oh, that looks just like the mosaics we um, excavated at Nan Ranch. And um, so I've done a, a drawing of those. They, um, they were associated with the burials. There again, I don't wanna put a photo of them, but I, um, they were made out of turquoise and shell. There are lots of avian forms. Um, I use that word um, loosely because some people think they're bats sometimes, but most of these are birds and um, there's a quite a similarity between the, these are our, our painted ones. Uh, I also, um, if you're looking for uh, site location information and names, I try to very generally describe them because um, it's very important to keep these sites um, protected. I know that most of the people here um, are not going to do any damage, but since this is going to go online, I don't want people using my presentation to try to figure out where the rock art images are. Macaws, which are very well publicized in places like Chaco, um, there really are not many found in the, the Hornada. Um, they, they did appear in the membranes um, excavations, but not, um, there's, there's rumor that there are, there were some macaw feathers found, uh, but um, only a few macaw images appear in the Hornatomonion region. <clears throat> and these are three examples. Um, There are also, um, I'm labeling these very loosely turkeys. Um, it's not for sure, but they certainly resemble that, those kind of figures. And there are more examples. So one thing I'll just mention here is that I have a um, jaguar and plume serpent, um, but um, I'm, I'm trying not to use anything beside a descriptive term here. Um, when I'm talking about these images, there are plenty of people that interpret this imagery and I think that's important, but I think they do so with ethnographic background and with um, uh, consultation with the, the tribes. So my idea is to capture the data and then help you know, share that and report on that um, rather than do all of the different pieces. This is a pretty full-time job as it is. 
Um, and then the same, so it's, my study is very narrow, but hopefully it will be useful to people. One of the curious things that we find too are these um, disembodied limbs. There's over a hundred in this area and then you just come along and there's an arm or a leg and they do also appear in the membranes. So um, you have this little guy with the limb in his mouth and this, I, for a long time, this figure I thought was um, uh, munching a flower until after looking at the site quite a few times, I realized that the leg comes down here too. We also have humans with animal headdresses um, all across the region. Um, some of them are um, pronghorn, some of them are deer, some of them are um, wolf heads or canine heads. Um, and, and you also see some on memory spotter and here's an example of that. One of the things that, uh, that is often said about the Hornada is that they were influenced by the Mesoamericans. And I always say, well, how come the Mesoamericans never have, you don't see bighorn sheep. This is something that's very, um, is kind of more in the Southwest. And we have a lot of bighorn sheep in the Hornada rock art, as well as on the Membris pottery. And it's often seems to be more than just a sheep. So I call those, again, I label those as ceremonial. And here's a classic one from the membranes, from one of the membranes pots. Um, and um, it, it may be a sheep, it may be uh, um, a horned serpent. <coughs> but we have, a lot of them, these sheep in the rock art um, that appear to not be what you would consider just a sheep. So is there a ceremony involved? Is there a reason that they're depicted this, this way? So that um, was an interesting um, comparison that I found. There are some um, uh, horned um, snakes in the Hornada rock art, as well as in the memories pottery. So this is an example. Although this may also be a fish, we don't have um, snakes that have um, feet and fish tails, but it may be a fantastic animal. So that's not um, definitely, an, it's not an interpretation. It's just um, an observation. Uh, this is one of four images that we find in, um, a cave in West Texas. This is a petroglyph with a, um, a man with a horn um, or a cap and then a long thin body. And this is, um, uh, this resembles a macaw. There again, I'm, I'm not saying it's a macaw, but it's, that's a close thing. And one that I found at you know, Waco tanks um, using D-stretch. We also have lots of composite animals both in the membranes um, rock art, uh, the, the Hornada rock art and the um, membranes pottery. He, these are obviously not um, natural animals. There's something else going on there. And it's not surprising then that we find these same sorts of images in um, the petroglyphs and pictographs. Um, We also have what um, uh, Mark Thomason has called a birthing position. I'm not sure that um, this, it certainly resembles that. And there are, there are examples, there are over 30 examples in the database, um, but there are also examples. Um, this is another one, and it very much resembles this figure um, from Three Rivers. And I use a little de-stretch magic to bring out the other one also. Um, although none of the ones that um, in the rock art um, have um, a baby, that's why I'm, I'm using this uh, posture word um, very loosely. There are also um, faces with beards, what appears like a beard, or it could be also a tattoo or face paint in both um, of the different media. 
And these are kind of not things that you notice when you're on your first visit. You have to really, um, or it helps to have um, people along who have a different point of view and they say, well, what is that? And, and so I really have felt that going um, out to these sites with different people is very helpful. This panel is um, north of town, north of Las Cruces. What is very interesting is it's um, outside of what is normally considered the Membrace area, but it's, um, it's along a pathway where the Membrace might have traveled to get back and forth um, across the San Andreas. And there's several um, similarities here to Membrace pottery. So you have, um, it's hard to see, but here is the, the knotted headdress, the knot, um, the man bun that you see on these two figures uh, that have, um, they've done studies where they were able to determine um, traits that were associated with male figures in the membranes. And that's one of them. This figure also has the same um, headdress, the um, ha hairdo. Um, we also see the, um, the eye design on this membrane pot, as well as this figure. And this animal here um, is very much like um, the one on the membrane pottery. Um, the other images along that same arroyo, um, which if you're traveling, to, through the San Andreas Mountains, um, the easiest way to cross from White Sands uh, that has membrane sites, um, sites that are membrane like and have membrane pottery, um, you would cross and, and um, go uh, to one of the, the outstanding points that you could see and then down this arroyo. And this is um, a, um, one of the figures you see again that very similar square jaw that you see on the membrane pottery. And then this geometric design, which um, resembles this um, textile or ceramic. Um, but you also find those same that same sort of design in ceramics. Horned lizards we see in, in both media. <laughs> and dragonflies, lots of dragonflies. Um, this is from a site that's really kind of outside of that normal boundary that has been um, designated as um, Hornada. It's in the Sierra Blanca, so it's, it's farther northeast, but a lot of the imagery is, is similar to what you see in the Hornada. And there are lots of dragonflies in or um, insects that uh, resemble dragonflies in um, the memory state database. So these are just a few of them. Um, there are not as many dragonfly-like images found um, as that other site, but we do have some. This one's near Silver Sodi. <clears throat> there are other avian forms on both the pottery and the, um, uh, in the uh, petroglyphs and pictographs. There aren't really many bats. Um, but there are a lot of bats in the um, memories pottery, but not in the rock art, or not ones that are obviously appear to be bats like this one down here. And the ones in the, um, on the memory ceramics are really very detailed. Some people um, actually um, feel like they can describe what species these bats are. <laughs> Now, many of the images that we see on the ceramics are mirror images because there again, we're talking about there's a round surface and the composition is very pleasing if you make these two opposing figures. Um, and then you can't really tell which way is up, but in, um, <coughs> in the uh, rock art, we don't find as many of those. We don't really find um, I looked around quite a lot. We do find some that are um, facing each other or appear to be two similar images, but not in this mirrored image way. <coughs> um, there are 
bear-like images on memories pottery, and there are a few um, in the uh, petroglyphs and pictographs, but more often you have what appears to be um, what could be bear in, um, footprints. So there's, there's again, there's, they're, they're sharing some of these similar images. One of the things that um, archaeologists have talked about that don't study the rock art is that there's a connection between the memories and the Holocom. Well, if you look at the Holocom rock art, it's very different than, than the Hornada, and it's very different than the ceramics. So I think um, there was definitely um, a lot of similar traits that the Holocom and memories shared. So I think the membranes were really working both sides. <coughs> Another thing that we see are these, um, um, whether they're antlions or scorpions, they're insect forms um, in the rock art and the pottery. There are quite a few um, examples. We also see them in, in other media, and this is, these are um, shell earrings in, in that shape. So really remarkably similar. Also, these are great fun. Um, the, you see the, these um, inchworms, um, obviously some kind of caterpillar um, on the memories pottery and then examples in, in the rock art. Um, this particular image is in another canyon, which is in line with the one um, to line up to go further towards the memory valley. So one of the things that I helped, my presentation in San and um, at the SAA was talking about following the rock art imagery and seeing if we could find a pathway um, to where they would have traded. Since we know they traded um, or migrated or traveled seasonally back and forth, um, to see if we could find that by mapping the similar rock art images. We also find moths, um, which are quite remarkable. And this, um, we have their, um, uh, a version of the hummingbird moth. They're quite large they, that we have. In fact, I saw one um, a couple of mornings ago uh, that, um, that uh, feed on various of our desert plants and including Detura. Now you would think that we'd have a lot of rabbits um, because in the rock art, um, one of the things is that we know the Hornada people ate um, rabbits, <coughs> but there's not many in the rock art. There are uh, more in uh, the memories um, pottery. So that's a little difference we have, but I looked pretty hard and there just aren't many uh, rabbits. So that tells me that we're not talking about hunting scenes here. Um, these rabbits are uh, um, probably serve some different purpose. We also have burden baskets, pardon me, that appear in memories pottery and in, um, in the petroglyphs. Um, these two figures are very far apart, but they both, um, it's kind of one of those things, it's like, is this a goggle eye? He appears on the, the basket. Um, it's one of the many intriguing things um, that I find when studying the rock art. There are some challenges. Um, I'm very lucky because in New Mexico, 40% of the land is owned by the federal government. Now that's, um, so uh, all the BLM land, um, uh, we are able to visit. So the rock art sites on the BLM uh, land are very um, accessible. So being able to visit those sites and compare them is, is um, it makes it a lot easy. But, easier, but we do have areas that are not public. And so they're kind of a blank space in my database. And those include the military reservation. So you have Fort Bliss and White Sands. Um, you have um, tribal land, um, you have the Mescalero um, reservation. Also, um, as I mentioned, there's parts of Mexico 
And then there are some swaths, big swaths of um, private land, although not um, a whole lot in, in this area. Um, and it, of course, in Texas, um, there, are, there have been some great reports done um, uh, about the White Sands, um, I mean, about the Fort Bliss and White Sands rock art. So I am able to do some comparisons there. So, uh, but those reports are really hard to find for researchers. Um, that's one of the challenges we have in this area because it's not as well known. Many of the, um, the books that you are able to find in other areas are not available. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is gonna die here pretty soon. <coughs> Anyhow, one of the interesting things is <laughs> um, we know that that people traveled north, south, and east, west. So mostly, I've been talking about the movement east and west. Um, but one area of private property um, was in Canada, Alamosa, um, which uh, rock art recorders um, were, had permission to record including Gary Hine and Leroy Unglob. And um, the principal investigator there gave me their photos. So I was able to add that to my database. And the initial reports were that there was only one image that looked like a memories design. And that was um, a birthing scene. But after using the magic of de-stretch, I found this little guy who I was pretty interesting and um, <coughs> I recognized other similar, the ears and the um, teeth that um, are pretty obvious. And, but I was like, mm, I haven't seen any of those on Memories Pottery. And then I went to, um, because I was able to visit the um, museum, I found this, this figure on one of the, the pots Memories pot pottery, there are examples that were probably made by children. This was one of them. And here's the figure with the teeth inside. Um, and when I showed that to one of my friends, he was like, that's Cosgrove's strange beast. And I was like, what? And um, the Cosgroves who explored the Memories area and the Three Rivers area in the late 20s, um, uh, Cosgrove described this figure that he found as a strange beast that was painted on the wall um, of a cliff ruin. I'd actually seen this, uh, a photograph of this image, um, but his mouth has fallen off or the mouth has fallen off. And so, uh, but um, the Cosgroves drew this image and so I was able to copy it and see the similarity. So, So these similarities seem to indicate to me that there was a shared cosmology there, the iconography that's similar over long distances, whether it was because of migration or ceremony or some social ties or trade um, that's at this point um, is still very new to my study and um, there's a lot more work to do. Often we ha have um, the rock art is understudied. This is a this was a report done by Lexon. Um, this is the drawings done by Lexon for um, a report on Cottonwood Canyon, and his <coughs> he said, "Well, there's a lot of rock art. It's obviously important, but he didn't say anything else. <coughs> the rock art is often." Um, not paid attention to. So I think it's really important that we do that. And especially because I think uh, comparisons with the memories pottery will show us um, the shared cosmology. Because in fact, oops, no, I guess that one up. Uh, this shows um, the uh, detailed work that um, we did on um, in Cottonwood where we recorded um, uh, over 
um, 300 panels and mapped and found a lot of information out on that site. One of the things um, that's also interesting is that um, every, almost every rock art site in the Hornada has archaic images. This is a jot, this is a big boulder. Uh, this is a 3D model. Um, and if you, it's hard to see, but there are lots of non-representational images and they're hard to see because they've been repatented. So they're older figures, but they're right next to the Hornada images. Um, here, this will helps you see it a little more. Um, but those places were visited by the same people long before the Hornada. So people have been traveling back and forth those same routes from Eastern New Mexico to the Membrace Valley before there were Membrace. Anyhow, I'm not the first person that said this. The Cobb's Crows, when they visited um, uh, Three Rivers, they actually excavated the uh, habitation site next to it. They saw these designs and they'd seen the designs on Memories Pottery and they said, this is the way to trace the migrations. Um, and so I have a lot of people to thank. Um, and uh, I'd wanna remind everyone to respect and protect the rock art. Um, and this is part of the way that I do it. So let me unshare or stop share. Right, are y'all asleep? Uh, quite the contrary. I think you've got us so uh, intrigued oh. that we're uh, we've lost our our, our voice. <laughs> Just well, enjoying, I certainly have. <laughs> we're enjoying the visual art that that uh, you've been showing us. Well, I always um, say dazzle with pictures, and then they don't really have to pay attention. But um, I think it worked. I I suspect everyone's been paying attention. Um, do you want to say anything more about the relationship between the dates or speculate on that a little bit? You, you kind of hinted that the rock art may have predated the, the images on the pottery. Well, and that's a kind of controversial thing. It's um, um, obviously the Hornaya people were um, in the area for a long period of time. They have earlier dates in the same sites of um, uh, it is, um, um, it's hard to date rock art. So we don't have a whole lot of examples yet. They're working that on them, thanks to Karen and her friends. Um, and, um, but we're, we're starting to get a date range. And so hopefully we'll be able to um, look more at that. But there were, in, there were um, um, pajos or or prayer sticks also found in the area with the uh, tablita headdresses that were 200 AD. So there was ceremony going on in those places um, well before the membranes um, were making ceramics. Um, so it's hard to say, but it, it, you know, it's one of those questions that just kind of fascinates me. Um, and, um, I think there's a good case to be made that the um, that the Hornada influenced the memories, but I think it went both ways. Um, yeah, has any textile survi survived? Um, just little um, little pieces, but most of those are in Arizona. Unfortunately, um, there were there were things found in Ceremonial Cave, which is near Waco Tanks, uh, but they were looted. Um, and part of the things that Miles um, Miller has dated are some of the, um, the artifacts um, there, but I don't think any of them have been textiles. Um, that one piece that I showed was um, actually, it was almost New Mexico, it was close enough. So, um, and there probably are, but we don't have the provenience because the memories ceramics were so incredibly beautiful um, 
and complicated. They were torn out of the ground by everybody and his brother. And we've lost the information that went with that, um, which, is, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, okay, so we do have some questions um, regarding the uh, sort of mythology. So here's one question. Do you see elements of okay. the Hanada? Could, oh. I need to get a glass. I need more water. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let okay. me get some more water. <laughs> it seems to have been a perennial need for the Southwest is water. So um yes if anybody else has a question please use the chat and then we'll just address them to margliff when she's back and has been uh, liquefied sorry i should have had a hot toddy <laughs> okay okay you've been to you've been through the water hole so uh, question is, do you see elements of the Hernada rock art that seem to relate to the Thompson Gilman Wyckoff idea that many elements of the Mimbres pottery relate to the somewhat Pan American hero twins mythology? Well, you remember my picture of my cat with the horned serpent? Um, I think interpreting things without more evidence is problematic. Um, I think that if you want to, you can make a case for a lot of things. I tend to be more circumspect. Um, there, it's a lot of um, work being done now, doing some of the DNA testing in Mexico. Um, unfortunately, you know, we can't test DNA in the United States, but they've tested some to try to figure out where the movements went. One of the things is, if you remember my map of the um, goggle eyes, um, they don't go further south. So if you do have the hero twins, um, how come they came north and other things didn't? Why didn't the bighorn sheep go south? It's very complicated. And I, I tend to try not to interpret it there's a really good book by um, Brian Schaefer where he talks about um, uh, the reasons why a lot of those things are, are very hard to prove. It's very seductive, I will, I will say that. And I do think that there were probably twins. Um, they, um, um, Linnea gave a really interesting talk at SAA about um, twin figures. I think that that's a commonality, but whether they are actually from the Popo Vu, um, I think that's a, a stretch. They also use a very small number of membrane bowls to um, um, look into that. And then the other thing is, <clears throat> if that's the case, now when I have comparisons of Hornada rock art, they're going to have to explain how the Popo Vu got into the Hornada. So, but I've discussed it with um, Pat and she's giving more talks. Um, so it'll be, it's, it's a in very interesting topic, but complicated. Yeah, now the goggle-eyed figure, Tlaloc, right? That's, we see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, remember those dates? What yeah. was the date I said? 600 That's... AD? Mm -hmm. Okay, Tlaloc is an Aztec deity. They were not in existence in 600 AD. Now they may have the same um, um, basis. We don't know that. Certainly there were other, Tlaloc is, is a rain deity, but he's a, also, he has a lot of other traits um, that are different than the one, the goggle-eyed figures um, that we see in, in our area. So he, they may all be related to rain, but if you use that term, you're using an Aztec term, which is after the time when they were first found in the, um, the Hornada. Yeah, I think it's also Maya, right? Um, there's an and, equivalent to Yeah, Maya. well, there's chalk and there's, there's names for various ones. Um, so it, <clears throat> that may be the case, but by, it's just like calling every flute player a Cocapelli. They're not all Cocapellis. <coughs> So that, and there again, 
that's my take on things. I try not to be interpreted. People love to, I mean, people want to know. And I understand that. I want to know too, but I'm just more circumstance. And, and I have, you know, I have all respect for Pat Gilman and, and what she's doing. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's a very interesting idea. I just don't see enough proof for me to totally agree. And, yeah. So I think uh, there's a question that I think you may have partially answered, but let me ask it again. Um, are any of these pottery sherds that you use for comparison from archaeologically dated contexts, or were they early museum collected pieces? Both. Um, so uh, a lot of them that were in um, archaeologic contexts, um, uh, so they were able to date them. They also um, date them by style. Um, they did a, um, they've done studies where they, uh, the membranes um, experts can look at a pot and decide by the rims, um, the number of um, uh, rim circles, uh, and by the way they were painted, which style they fit in, and those were found in, um, and they cross-checked those with the excavations that they did. So they might find something that looks like something, uh, they, so they find a pot that has the same style, but has no provenience as one that had a provenience and had dates. So that's that's how they do that. Um, okay, so here's another question. What about a connection between Mogollon imagery and that which is called Rio Grande style? It seems like a lot of similar iconography. Ooh, who's that person? They get an A. Oh, there you oh, go. Yeah. That was um, Chris Rhodes. Oh, um, so, um, there is a lot of similarity. Um, uh, people have different ideas of where these ideas came from. Um, one of my projects is to try to compare some of the mask imagery, but we, I think um, some people think that the, the Katsina religion came from the, um, the Four Corners and moved into the Rio Grande. Um, I see many similarities and we have Kachina light figures in um, the Hornada. So it may have gone both ways. Um, there, that, this is the place where I think really would having native voices is an important part of looking at that. I, I see similarities visually but I would like to really have more um, uh, input from the, the Native community. Um, okay, I think that's it. There may, you might want to check the chat. Someone said that they might have sent something directly to you. I, I don't know if that's the case, but you can take a quick look if you want to see if there's anything addressed to you. Yeah, somebody said um, uh, um, that um, the drawings were, were were important, and I would reiterate that um, uh, very much. So um, photographs are great; I use them all the time, and I'm I'm not saying just drawing. I think we need to use both. One of the things is that. Um, and I, I showed you in my PowerPoint where I used an image that was um, um, uh, a photo and then the drawing it's that it made it clearer. So got another note here from um, Joss and Kyle looking for horned serpents in members bowls. Um, uh, there, um, that's a, a really interesting topic that Scott Nicolay um, addressed in uh, at the SAA. We had a whole session um, in um, at SAA on these the the kind of the out um, the boundaries of the Hornada. And so Scott's idea is that the horned serpent didn't come um, until later. Um, that in and often people say, oh, look, it's Awanyu. Well, that's a word from the North. And there's a big difference when you start to look at that. So 
There, um, Josh um, and, and Kyle pointed out that there are not many examples in, I think there may be four or five uh, in the members pottery and two or three of them are from private collections. What happens many times is because these images are so beautiful, people fake them. They either are really good at, or they'll take a memories bowl that doesn't have a design <clears throat> and paint on it. And so, um, and then because they, I mean, some of them sell for $30,000. So um, as far as I've, uh, I've looked for Scott, uh, I've only found about 50, what I would consider the horned serpents. And a bunch of those are really iffy. And so 50 is not very many when you consider that at Three Rivers, there are 22,000 images, not many. Um, so good observation, guys. What's the uh, most... Uh depicted figure at Three Rivers? Circle. Circle. How about, rep how about sort of some animal? Um, I'd, I'd have to look at the, the uh, information, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, the nice thing is Three Rivers has been completely recorded um, and we sort of have a database. Um, unfortunately, it was done. I mean, it was done beautifully. They did an incredible job, um, but the standards have changed now. Um, and and the, the database right now, it actually was created in Lotus. Some of you probably don't remember that and was on a floppy. And so it was printed in a book, but it was like 14 pages or something like that. And it was on this floppy. But we have a hero in our myths because Bob Mark was able to take that floppy and Lotus and convert it to an Excel spreadsheet so that now I can slice and dice that information. Um, now, if we could just connect all the points to a GIS, that would be great, but that's down the road. Yeah, well done. Uh, well, I think uh, we're gonna let you rest your voice now. So thanks again, Margaret, for your presentation. And thanks to all the attendees for your interest. Again, if you'd like to learn more about Aurora and our upcoming virtual conference in June, please check out our website and Facebook pages. And if so inclined, now is always a good time to renew or to join our membership. Our next event will be on May 14th with Linnea Sundstrom speaking about invisible women, cavemen, and M&Ms, finding the hidden half in rock art. And uh, Margaret's presentation will make it to our YouTube channel once I have a chance to uh, do some editing and get that put together. So I can't give you an exact date when it will be up there, but I would say, uh, you know, in a few weeks, it should be there. Um, so anyway, we hope to see you all again for Linnea's presentation next month, which is clearly a must-see presentation. Also, she's got a hard act to follow after Marglyphs. Um, so thanks again, everybody. And until next time, good evening and stay safe.